Chapter 14 Hercule Poirot's observation had not been at fault. There were no pearls on the table by Lynette Doyle's bed. Louise Bourget was bidden to make a search among Lynette's belongings. According to her, all was in order. Only the pearls had disappeared. As they emerged from the cabin, a steward was waiting to tell them that breakfast had been served in the smoking room. As they passed along the deck, Poirot paused to look over the rail. Aha! I see you have had an idea, my friend. Yes, it suddenly came to me when Van Thorpe mentioned that he had heard a splash, and I too had been awakened sometime last night by a splash. It's perfectly possible that, after the murder, the murderer threw the pistol overboard. Poirot said slowly, Do you think that is possible, my friend? Race shrugged his shoulders. It's a suggestion. After all, the pistol wasn't anywhere in the cabin. First thing I looked for. All the same, said Poirot, it is incredible that it should have been thrown overboard. Race said, Where is it then? Poirot said thoughtfully, If it is not in Mrs. Doyle's cabin, there is, logically, only one other place where it could be. Where is that? At Mademoiselle de Belfort's cabin. Yes, I see. He stopped suddenly. She's out of her cabin. Shall we go and have a look now? Poirot shook his head. No, my friend. That would be precipitate. It may not yet have been put there. What about an immediate search of the whole boat? That way we would show our hand. We must work with great care. It is very delicate our position at the moment. Let us discuss the situation as we eat. Race agreed. They went into the smoking room. Well said Race as he poured himself out a cup of coffee. We've got two definite leads. There's the disappearance of the pearls, and there's the man Fleetwood. As regards the pearls, robbery seems indicated, but I... I don't know whether you'll agree with me. Otto said quickly, It was an odd moment to choose. Exactly. To steal the pearls on a voyage such as this invites a close search of everybody on board. How then could the thief hope to get away with his booty? He might have gone ashore and dumped it. The company always has a watchman on the bank. Then that is not feasible. Was the murder committed to divert attention from the robbery? No, that does not make sense. It is profoundly unsatisfactory. But supposing that Mrs. Doyle woke up and caught the thief in the act, and therefore the thief shot her. But she was shot while she slept. So that too does not make sense. You know, I have a little idea about those pearls. And yet, no, it is impossible. Because if my idea was right, the pearls would not have disappeared. Tell me, what did you think of the maid? I wondered, said Ray slowly. If she knew more than she said. Ah, you too had that impression. Definitely not a nice girl, said Reyes. Hercule Poirot nodded. Yes, I think I would not trust her that one. You think she had something to do with the murder? No, I would not say that. With the theft of the pearls, then. That is more probable. She had only been with Mrs. Doyle a very short time. She may be a member of a gang that specializes in jewel robberies. In such a case, there is often a maid with excellent references. Unfortunately, we are not in a position to seek information on these points. And yet that explanation does not quite satisfy me. Those pearls. Ah, sacre. My little idea ought to be right. And yet nobody would be so imbecile. He broke off. What about the man Fleetwood? We must question him. It may be that we have there the solution. If Louis Bourget's story is true, he had a definite motive for revenge. 
He could have been overheard the scene between Jacqueline and Mr. Doyle, and when they have left the saloon, he could have darted in and secured the gun. Yes, it is all quite possible. And that letter J scrawled in blood, that too would accord with a simple, rather crude nature. In fact, he is just the person we're looking for. Yes, only... Poro rubbed his nose. He said with a slight grimace, See you, I recognize my own weaknesses. It has been said of me that I like to make a case difficult. This solution that you put to me, it is too simple, too easy. I cannot feel that it really happened. And yet, that may be sheer prejudice on my part. Well, we'd better have the fellow here. Brace rang the bell and gave the order. And then he said, Any other possibilities? Plenty, my friend. There is, for example, the American trustee. Pennington? Yes, Pennington. There was a curious little scene in here the other day. He narrated the happenings to race. You see... It is significant. Madame, she wanted to read all the papers before signing. So he makes the excuse of another day. And then the husband, he makes a very significant remark. What was that? He says, I never read anything. I sign where I am told to sign. You perceive the significance of that? Pennington did. I saw it in his eye. He looked at Doyle as though an entirely new idea had come into his head. Just imagine, my friend, that you have been left trustee to the daughter of an intensely wealthy man. You use, perhaps, that money to speculate with. I know it is so in all detective novels, but you read of it too in the newspapers. It happens, my friend, it happens. I don't dispute it, said Reyes. There is, perhaps... Still time to make good by speculating wildly. Your ward is not yet of age. And then she marries. The control passes from your hands into hers at a moment's notice. A disaster. But there is still a chance. She is on a honeymoon. She will perhaps be careless about business. A casual paper slipped in among others, signed without reading. But Lynette Doyle was not like that. Honeymoon or no honeymoon. She was a businesswoman, and then her husband makes a remark, and a new idea comes to that desperate man who is seeking a way out from ruin. If Lynette Doyle were to die, her fortune would pass to her husband, and he would be easy to deal with. He would be a child in the hand of an astute man like Andrew Pennington. Mon cher colonel, I tell you I saw the thought pass through Andrew Pennington's head. If only it were Doyle I had got to deal with. That is what he was thinking. Quite possible, I dare say, said Ray dryly. But you've no evidence. Alas, no. Then there is young Ferguson, said Ray. He talks bitterly enough, not that I go by talk. Still, he might be the fellow whose father was ruined by Old Ridgeway. It's a little far-fetched, but it's possible. People do brood over bygone wrongs sometimes. He paused a minute and then said, And there's my fellow. Yes, there is your fellow, as you call him. He's a killer, said Reyes. We know that. On the other hand, I can't see any way in which he could have come up against Lynette Doyle. Their orbits don't touch. Poro said slowly, Unless, accidentally... She had become possessed of evidence showing his identity. That's possible, but it seems highly unlikely. There was a knock at the door. Ah, there's our would-be bigamist. Fleetwood was a big, truculent-looking man. He looked suspiciously from one to the other of them as he entered the room. Poirot recognized him as the man he had seen talking to Louise Bourget. Fleetwood said suspiciously, you wanted to see me? We did, said Reyes. 
You probably know that a murder was committed on this boat last night. Fleetwood nodded. And I believe it's true that you had reason to feel anger against the woman who was killed. A look of alarm sprang up in Fleetwood's eyes. Who told you that? You considered that Mrs. Doyle had interfered between you and a young woman. I know who told you that. That lying French hussy. She's a liar through and through, that girl. But this particular story happens to be true. It's a dirty lie. You say that, although you don't know what it is yet. The shot told. The man flushed and gulped. It is true, is it not, that you were going to marry the girl Marie, and that she broke it off when she discovered that you were a married man already? What business was it of hers? You mean, what business was it of Mrs. Doyle's? Well, you know, bigamy is bigamy. It wasn't like that. I married one of the locals out here. It didn't answer. She went back to her people. I've not seen her for half a dozen years. Still, you were married to her. The man was silent. Race went on. Mrs. Doyle, or Miss Ridgway, as she then was, found out all this. Yes, she did, Cursor. Nosing about where no one ever asked her to. I'd have treated Marie right. I'd have done anything for her. And she'd never have known anything about the other. If it hadn't been for that meddlesome young lady... And I felt bitter about it when I saw her on this boat all dressed up in pearls and diamonds and loading it all over the place with never a thought that she'd broken a man's life for him. I felt bitter, all right. But if you think I'm a dirty murderer, if you think I went and shot her with a gun, well, that's a damned lie. I never touched her, and that's God's truth. He stopped. The sweat was rolling down his face. Where were you last night between the hours of twelve and two? In my bunk, asleep, and my weight will tell you so. We shall see, said Race. He dismissed him with a curt nod. That'll do. Eh bien, said Poirot as the door closed behind Fleetwood. Race shrugged his shoulders. He tells quite a straight story. He's nervous, of course, but not unduly so. We'll have to investigate his alibi, though I don't suppose it will be decisive. His mate was probably asleep, and this fellow could have slipped in and out if he wanted to. Depends whether anyone else saw him. Yes, one must inquire as to that. The next thing, I think, is whether anyone heard anything which might give us a clue to the time of the crime. Bessner places it as having occurred between twelve and two. It seems reasonable to hope that someone among the passengers may have heard the shot, even if they did not recognize it for what it was. I didn't hear anything of the kind myself. What about you? Poro shook his head. Me? I slept absolutely like the log. I heard nothing, but nothing at all. I might have been drugged I slept so soundly. A pity said Reyes. Well, let's hope we have a bit of luck with the people who have cabins on the starboard side. Vanthorpe, we're done. The Allertons come next. I'll send the steward to fetch them. Mrs. Allerton came in briskly. She was wearing a soft gray striped silk dress. Her face looked distressed. It's too horrible she said as she accepted the chair that Poirot placed for her. I could hardly believe it. That lovely creature with everything to live for. Dead. I almost feel I can't believe it. I know how you feel, madame, said Poirot sympathetically. I'm glad you are on board, said Mrs. Allerton simply. You will be able to find out who did it. I'm so glad it isn't that poor, tragic girl. You mean Mademoiselle de Belfort? Who told you she did not do it? Cornelia Robson, said Mrs. Allerton with a faint smile. You know, she's simply thrilled by it all. It's probably the only exciting thing that has ever happened to her, and probably the only exciting thing that ever will happen to her. But she's so nice that she's terribly ashamed of enjoying it. She thinks it's awful of her. 
Mrs. Arton gave a look at Poirot and then added, But I mustn't chatter. You want to ask me questions. If you please. You went to bed at what time, madame? Just after half past ten. And you went to sleep at once? Yes, I was sleepy. And did you hear anything, anything at all, during the night? Mrs. Allerton wrinkled her brows. Yes, I think I heard a splash and someone running. Or was it the other way about? I'm rather hazy. I just had a vague idea that someone had fallen overboard at sea. A dream, you know. Then I woke up and listened, but it was all quite quiet. Do you know what time that was? No, I'm afraid I don't. But I don't think it was very long after I went to sleep. I mean, it was with the first hour or so. Alas, madame, that is not very definite. No, I know it isn't. But it's no good my trying to guess, is it? I haven't really the vaguest idea. And that is all you can tell us, madame? I'm afraid so. Had you ever actually met Mrs. Doyle before? No. Timid matter. And I'd heard a good deal about her through a cousin of ours, Joanna Southwood, but I'd never spoken to her till we met at Aswan. I have one other question, madame, if you will pardon me for asking. Mrs. Arton murmured with a faint smile. I should be loved to be asked an indiscreet question. It is this. Did you, or your family, ever suffer any financial loss through the operations of Mrs. Doyle's father, Mellowish Ridway. Mrs. Allard had looked thoroughly astonished. Oh, no. The family finances have never suffered except by dwindling. You know, everything paying less interest than it used to. There's never been anything melodramatic about our poverty. My husband left very little money, but what he left I still have, though it doesn't yield as much as it used to yield. Thank you, madame. Perhaps you will ask your son to come to us. Tim said lightly when his mother came to him. Ordeal over? My turn now? What sort of things do they ask you? Only whether I heard anything last night, said Mrs. Arton. And unluckily I didn't hear anything at all. I can't think why not. After all, Ned's cap is only one away from mine. I should think I've been bound to hear the shot. Go along, Tim. They're waiting for you. To Tim Allerton, Poirot repeated his previous question. Tim answered, I went to bed early, half past ten or so. I read for a bit, put out my light just after eleven. Did you hear anything after that? Heard a man's voice saying good night, I think, not far away. That was I saying good night to Mrs. Doyle said Reyes. Yes. After that I went to sleep. Then later I heard a kind of hullabaloo going on. Somebody calling Fanthorpe, I remember. It's Robson when she ran out from the observation sloop. Yes, I suppose that was it. And then a lot of different voices, and then somebody running along the deck, and then a splash. And then I heard old Besner booming out something about, careful now, and not too quick. You heard a splash? Well, something of that kind. You are sure it was not a shot you heard? Mm, yes, I suppose it might have been. I did hear a cork pop. Perhaps that was the shot. I may have imagined the splash connecting the idea of the cork with liquid pouring into a glass. I know my foggy idea was that there was some kind of party on, and I wished they'd all go to bed and shut up. Anything more after that? Tim thought. Only Fanthorpe barging round in his cabin next door. I thought he'd never get to bed. And after that? Tim shrugged his shoulders. After that, oblivion. You heard nothing more. Nothing whatever. Thank you, Mr. Allerton. Tim got up and left the cabin. Chapter 15 Race poured thoughtfully over a plan of the promenade deck of the Karnak. Vanthorpe, young Allerton, Mrs. Allerton, 
then an empty cabin, Simon Doyle's. Now who's on the other side of Mrs. Doyle's? The old American dame. If anyone heard anything, she should have done. If she's up, we'd better have her along. Miss Van Schuyler entered the room. She looked even older and yellower than usual this morning. Her small, dark eyes had an air of venomous displeasure in them. Grace rose and bowed. We're very sorry to trouble you, Miss Van Schuyler. It's very good of you. Please sit down. Miss Van Schuyler said sharply, I dislike being mixed up in this. I resent it very much. I do not wish to be associated in any way with this, sir. Very unpleasant affair. Quite, quite. I was just saying to Mujoboro that the sooner we took your statement, the better, as then you need have no further trouble. Miss Van Scatter looked at Poirot with something approaching favor. I'm glad you both realize my feelings. I'm not accustomed to anything of this kind. Poirot said soothingly, Precisely, mademoiselle. That is why we wish to free you from the unpleasantness as quickly as possible. Now you went to bed last night. At what time? Ten o'clock is my usual time. Last night I was rather later, as Cordelia Robson very inconsiderately kept me waiting. Très bien, mademoiselle. Now what did you hear after you had retired? Miss Van Schuyler said, I sleep very lightly. Ah, merve, that is very fortunate for us. I was awoken by that rather flashy young woman, uh, Mrs. Doyle's maid, who said, Bon nuit, madame, but I cannot but think an unnecessarily loud voice. And after that, I went to sleep again. I woke up thinking someone was in my cabin, but I realized it was someone in the cabin next door. In Mrs. Doyle's cabin? Yes. Then I heard someone outside on the deck, and then a splash. You have no idea what time this was? I can tell you the time exactly. It was ten minutes past one. You are sure of that? Yes. I looked at my little clock that stands by my bed. You did not hear a shot? No, nothing of the kind. But it might possibly have been a shot that awakened you. Miss Van Schuyler considered the question, her toad-like head on one side. It might, she admitted rather grudgingly. And you have no idea what caused the splash you heard? Not at all. I know perfectly. Colonel Ray sat up alertly. You know? Certainly. I did not like the sound of prowling around. I got up and went to the door of my cabin. Miss Otterborn was leaning over the side. She had just dropped something into the water. Miss Otterborn? Ray sounded really surprised. Yes, you are quite sure it was Miss Otterborn. I saw her face distinctly. She did not see you. I do not think so. Poirot leant forward. And what did her face look like, mademoiselle? She was in a condition of considerable emotion. Race and Poirot exchanged a quick glance. And then, Race prompted, Miss Otterborn went away around the stern of the boat, and I returned to bed. There was a knock at the door, and the manager entered. He carried in his hand a dripping bundle. You've got it, Colonel. Race took the package. He unwrapped fold after fold of sodden velvet. Out of it fell a coarse handkerchief faintly stained with pink, wrapped round a small pearl-handled pistol. Grace gave Poirot a glance of slightly malicious triumph. You see, he said, my idea was right. It was thrown overboard. He held the pistol out of the palm of his hand. What do you say, Mojo Poirot? Is this the pistol you saw at the Cataract Hotel that night? Poirot examined it carefully. Then he said quietly, Yes, that is it. There is the ornamental work on it and the initials J.P. It is an article de luxe, a 
a very feminine production, but it is nonetheless a lethal weapon. Twenty-two, murmured Reyes. He took out the clip. Two bullets fired. Yes, there doesn't seem much doubt about it. Miss Van Schuyler coughed significantly. And what about my stole? she demanded. Your stole, mademoiselle? Yes, that's my velvet stole you have here. Grace picked up the dripping folds of material. This is yours, Miss Van Schuyler? Certainly it's mine, the old lady snapped. I missed it last night. I was asking everyone if they'd seen it. Poro questioned Race with a glance, and the latter gave a slight nod of assent. Where did you see it last night, Miss Van Schuyler? I had it in the saloon yesterday evening. When I came to go to bed, I could not find it anywhere. You realize what it's been used for? He spread it out, indicating with a finger the scorching in several small holes. The murderer wrapped it around the pistol that deadened the noise of the shot. Impertinence, snapped the scent Schuyler. The color rose in her wizened cheeks. I shall be glad, Miss Van Schuyler, if you will tell me the extent of your previous acquaintance with Mrs. Doyle. There was no previous acquaintance. But you knew of her. I knew who she was, of course. But your families were not acquainted. As a family, we have always prided ourselves on being exclusive, Colonel Reyes. My dear mother would never have dreamed of calling upon any of the Hart's family, who, outside their wealth, who were nobodies. That is all you have to say, Miss Van Schuyler. I have nothing to add to what I've told you. Lynette Ridgway was brought up in England, and I never saw her till I came aboard this boat. She rose. Poirot opened the door for her, and she marched out. The eyes of the two men met. That's her story, said Reyes, and she's going to stick to it. It may even be true. I don't know. But Rosalie Otterborn, I hadn't expected that. Poirot shook his head in a perplexed manner. Then he brought down his hand on the table with a sudden bang. But it does not make sense, he cried. Nom do nom do nom. It does not make sense. Grace looked at him. What do you mean exactly? I mean that up to a point it is all the clear sailing. Someone wished to kill Annette Doyle. Someone overheard the scene in the saloon last night. Someone sneaked in there and retrieved the pistol. Jack and the Belfort's pistol, remember. Somebody shot Lynette Doyle with that pistol and wrote the letter J on the wall. All so clear, is it not? All pointing to Jack de Belfort as the murderess. And then what does the murderer do? Leave the pistol, the damning pistol, Jack de Belfort's pistol for everyone to find? No, he or she throws the pistol, that particular damning piece of evidence, overboard. Why, my friend, why? Ray shook his head. It's odd. It is more than odd. It is impossible. Not impossible, since it happened. I do not mean that. I mean that the sequence of events is impossible. Something is wrong. Chapter 16 Colonel Race glanced curiously at his colleague. He respected, he had reason to respect, the brain of Hercule Boirot. Yet for the moment he did not follow the other's process of thought. He asked no question, however. He seldom did ask questions. He proceeded straightforwardly with the matter at hand. What's the next thing to be done? Questioned the Otterborn girl. Yes, that may advance us a little. Rosalie Otterborn entered ungraciously. She did not look nervous or frightened in any way, merely unwilling and sulky. Well, she said, what is it? Grace was the spokesman. We're investigating Mrs. Doyle's death, he explained. Rosalie nodded. Will you tell me what you did last night? Rosalie reflected a minute. Mother and I went to bed early, before eleven. We didn't hear anything in particular, except a bit of fuss outside Dr. Pesner's cabin. I heard the old man's German voice booming away. 
Of course, I didn't know what it was all about till this morning. You didn't hear a shot? No. Did you leave your cabin at all last night? No. You were quite sure of that? Rosalie stared at him. What do you mean? Of course I'm sure of it. You did not, for instance, go round to the starboard side of the boat and throw something overboard. The color rose in her face. Is there any rule against throwing things overboard? No, of course not. Then you did? No, I didn't. I never left my cabin, I tell you. Then if anyone says that they saw you, she interrupted him. Who says they saw me? Miss Van Schuyler. Miss Van Schuyler? She sounded genuinely astonished. Yes, Miss Van Schuyler says she looked out of her cabin and saw you throw something over the side. Rosalie said clearly, That's a damned lie. Then as though struck by a sudden thought, she asked, What time was this? It was Poirot who answered. It was ten minutes past one, mademoiselle. She nodded her head thoughtfully. Did she see anything else? Poirot looked at her curiously. He stroked his chin. See? No. But she heard something. What did she hear? Someone moving about in Mrs. Doyle's cabin. I see, muttered Rosalie. She was pale now, deadly pale. And you persist in saying that you threw nothing overboard, mademoiselle. Why on earth should I run about throwing things overboard in the middle of the night? There might be a reason, an innocent reason. Innocent? said the girl sharply. That is what I said. You see, mademoiselle, something was thrown overboard last night. Something that was not innocent. Ray silently held out the bundle of stained velvet, opening it to display its contents. Rosalie Otterborn shrank back. Was that what she was killed with? Yes, mademoiselle. And you think that I... I did it? What utter nonsense! Why on earth should I want to kill Lynette Doyle? I don't even know her. She laughed and stood up scornfully. The whole thing is too ridiculous. Remember, Miss Otterborn, said Ray's that Miss Van Schuyler is prepared to swear she saw your face quite clearly in the moonlight. Rosalie laughed again. That old cat, she's probably half-blind anyway. It was me she saw. She paused. Can I go now? Race nodded and Rosalie Otterborn left the room. The eyes of the two men met. Race lighted a cigarette. Well, that's that flat contradiction. Which of them do we believe? Poirot shook his head. I have a little idea that neither of them was being quite frank. That's the worst of our job, said Reyes despondently. So many people keep back the truth for positively futile reasons. What's our next move? Get on with the questioning of the passengers? I think so. It is always well to proceed with order and method. Grace nodded. Mrs. Otterborn, dressed in floating batik material, succeeded her daughter. She corroborated Rosalie's statement that they had both gone to bed before eleven o'clock. She herself had heard nothing of interest during the night. She could not say whether Rosalie had left their cabin or not. On the subject of the crime, she was inclined to hold forth. The crime passionel, she exclaimed, the primitive instinct to kill, so closely allied to the sex instinct, that girl Jacqueline, half Latin, hot-blooded, obeying the deepest instincts of her being, stealing forth revolver in hand. But Jacqueline de Belfort did not shoot Mrs. Doyle. 
That we know for certain. It is proved, explained Poro. Her husband, then, said Mrs. Otterborn, rallying from the blow. The blood lust and the sex instinct, a sexual crime. There are many well-known instances. Mr. Doyle was shot through the leg, and he was quite unable to move. The bone was fractured, explained Colonel Reyes. He spent the night with Dr. Besner. Mrs. Otterborn was even more disappointed. She searched her mind hopefully. Of course, she said. How foolish of me. Miss Bowers. Miss Bowers? Yes, naturally. It's so clear psychologically. Repression. The repressed virgin, maddened by the sight of these two. The young husband and wife passionately in love with each other. Of course it was her. She's just the type. Sexually unattractive, innately respectable, in my book, the Baron Vine. The colonel interposed tactfully. Your suggestions have been most helpful, Mrs. Otterborn. We must get on with our job now. Thank you so much. He escorted her gallantly to the door and came back wiping his brow. What a poisonous woman. Why didn't somebody murder her? It may yet happen. Poirot consoled him. There might be some sense in that. Who have we got left? Pennington. We'll keep him for the end, I think. Ricchetti. Ferguson. Signor Ricchetti was very voluble. Very agitated. But what a horror, what an infamy, a young woman so beautiful. Indeed, an inhuman crime. Signor Ricchetti's hands flew expressively up in the air. His answers were prompt. He had gone to bed early, very early. In fact, immediately after dinner. He had read for a while a very interesting pamphlet lately published, Prahistorische Forschung in Kleinasien, throwing an entirely new light on the painted pottery of the Anatolian foothills. He had put out his light some time before eleven. No, he had not heard any shot, not any sound like the pop of a cork. The only thing he had heard, but that was later in the middle of the night, was a splash, a big splash, just near his porthole. Your cabin is on the lower deck, on the starboard side, is it not? Yes, yes, that's so. And I hear the big splash. His arms flew up once more to describe the bigness of the splash. Can you tell me what time that was? Signor Chetty reflected. It was one, two, three hours after I go to sleep. Perhaps two hours. About ten minutes past one, for instance. It might very well be, yes. Ah, but what a terrible crime. How inhuman. How so charming a woman. Exit Signora Chetti, still gesticulating freely. Grace looked at Poirot. Poro raised his eyebrows expressively, then shrugged his shoulders. They passed on to Mr. Ferguson. Ferguson was difficult. He sprawled insolently in a chair. Grand ado about this business, he sneered. What's it really matter? A lot of superfluous women in the world, Ray said coldly. Can we have an account of your movements last night, Mr. Ferguson? Don't see why you should. But I don't mind. I mooched around a good bit. Went ashore with Miss Robson. When she went back to the boat, I mooched around by myself for a while. Came back and turned in round about midnight. Your cabin is on the lower deck, starboard side? Yes, I'm not up among the knobs. Did you hear a shot? It might only have sounded like the popping of a cork, Ferguson considered. Mm, yes, I think I did hear something like a cork. Can't remember when, before I went to sleep. But there was still a lot of people about then, commotion running about on the deck above. That was probably the shot fired by Mr. Belfort. 
You didn't hear another? Ferguson shook his head. Nor a splash? A splash? Mm. Yes, I believe I did hear a splash. But there was so much row going on, I can't be sure about it. Did you leave your cabin during the night? Ferguson grinned. No, I didn't. And I didn't participate in the good work. Worse luck. Come, come, Mr. Ferguson, don't behave childishly. The young man reacted angrily. Why shouldn't I say what I think? I believe in violence. But you don't practice what you preach, murmured Poirot. I wonder. He leaned forward. It was the man Fleetwood, was it not, who told you that Lynette Doyle was one of the richest women in England? What's Fleetwood got to do with this? Fleetwood, my friend, had an excellent motive for killing Lynette Doyle. He had a special grudge against her. Mr. Ferguson came up out of his seat like a jack-in-the-box. So that's your dirty game, is it? He demanded wrathfully. Put it on to a poor devil like Fleetwood who can't defend himself, who's got no money to hire lawyers. I'll tell you this, if you try and settle Fleetwood with his business, you'll have me to deal with. And who exactly are you? asked Poirot sweetly. Mr. Ferguson got rather red. I can stick by my friends, anyway, he said gruffly. Well, Mr. Ferguson, I think that's all we need for the present. As the door closed behind Ferguson, he remarked unexpectedly, Rather a likable young cub, really. You don't think he is the man you are after? asked Poirot. I hardly think so. I suppose he's on board. The information was very precise. Oh, well. One job at a time. Let's have a go at Pennington. Chapter 17 Andrew Pennington displayed all the conventional reactions of grief and shock. He was, as usual, carefully dressed. He had changed into a black tie. His long, clean-shaven face bore a bewildered expression. Gentlemen, he said sadly, this business has got me right down. Little Annette, why, I remember her as the cutest little thing you can imagine. How proud of her Mellowish Ridgeway used to be, too. Well, there's no point in going into that. Just tell me what I can do. That's all I ask, Grace said. To begin with, Mr. Pennington, did you hear anything last night? No, sir, I can't say I did. I have the cabin right next to Dr. Besner's, number 3839, and I heard a certain commotion going on in there round about midnight or so. Of course, I didn't know what it was at the time. You heard nothing else? No shots? Andrew Pennington shook his head. Nothing whatever of the kind. And you went to bed? Must have been some time after eleven. He leaned forward. I don't suppose it's news to you to know that there's plenty of rumors going about the boat. That half-French girl, Jacqueline de Belfort, there was something fishy there, you know. Lynette didn't tell me anything, but naturally I wasn't born blind and deaf. There'd been some affair between her and Simon sometime, hadn't there? Charlevem. That's a pretty good sound rule, and I should say you wouldn't have to char far. Poirot said. You mean that in your belief, Jacqueline de Belfort shot Mrs. Doyle? That's what it looks like to me. Of course, I don't know anything. Unfortunately, we do know something. Eh? Mr. Pennington looked startled. We know that it is quite impossible for Mrs. de Belfort to have shot Mrs. Doyle. He explained carefully the circumstances. Pennington seemed reluctant to accept them. I agree, it looks all right on the fact of it. But this hospital nursewoman, I'll bet she didn't stay awake all night. She dozed off, and the girl slipped out and in again. Hardly likely, Monsieur Pennington. She had administered a strong opiate, remember. And anyway, a nurse is in the habit of sleeping lightly and waking when her patient wakes. It all sounds rather fishy to me, said Pennington. Ray said in a gently authoritative manner. 
I think you must take it from me, Mr. Pennington, that we have examined all the possibilities very carefully. The result is quite definite. Jacqueline de Belfort did not shoot Mrs. Doyle, so we are forced to look elsewhere. That is where we hope you may be able to help us. I? Pennington gave a nervous start. Yes, you were an intimate friend of the dead woman's. You know the circumstances of her life, in all probability much better than her husband does, since he only made her acquaintance a few months ago. You would know, for instance, of anyone who had a grudge against her. You would know, perhaps, whether there was anyone who had a motive for desiring her death. Andrew Pennington passed his tongue over rather dry-looking lips. I assure you I have no idea. You see, Lynette was brought up in England. I know very little of her surroundings and associations. And yet, mused Poirot, there was someone on board who was interested in Mrs. Doyle's removal. She had a mere scrape before, you remember, at this very place, when that boulder crashed down. Ah, but well, you were not there, perhaps. No, I was inside the temple at the time. I heard about it afterwards, of course, a very near escape. But possibly an accident, don't you think? Poirot shrugged his shoulders. One thought so at the time. Now, one wonders. Yes, yes, of course. Pennington wiped his face with a fine silk handkerchief. Colonel Race went on. Mrs. Doyle happened to mention someone being on board who bore a grudge, not against her personally, but against her family. Do you know who that could be? Pennington looked genuinely astonished. No, I have no idea. She didn't mention the matter to you? No. You were an intimate friend of her father's. You cannot remember any business operation of his that might have resulted in ruin for some business opponent. Pennington shook his head helplessly. No outstanding case. Such operations were frequent, of course, but I can't recall anyone who uttered threats. Nothing of that kind. In short, Mr. Pennington, you cannot help us. It seems so. I deplore my inadequacy, gentlemen. Race interchanged a glance with Pearl. I'm sorry, too. We had hopes. He got up as a sign the interview was at an end. Andrew Pennington said, As the door was laid up, I expect you'd like me to see to things. Pardon me, Colonel, but what exactly are the arrangements? When we leave here, we shall make a non-stop run to Shalal, arriving there tomorrow morning. And the body? Will be removed to one of the cold storage chambers. Andrew Pennington bowed his head. Then he left the room. Poirot and Race again interchanged a glance. Mr. Pennington, said Race, lighting a cigarette was not at all comfortable. Poirot nodded. And, he said, Mr. Pennington was sufficiently perturbed to tell a rather stupid lie. He was not in the temple of Abu Simbel when that boulder fell. I, Moki can swear to that. I had just come from there. A very stupid lie, said Reyes. And revealing one. Again, Poirot nodded. But for the moment, we handle him with the gloves of the kid. Is it not so? That was the idea, said Reyes. My friend, you and I understand each other to a marvel. There was a faint grinding noise, a stir beneath their feet. The Karnak had started on her homeward journey to Shalal. Pearls, said Reyes. That's the next thing to be cleared up. You have a plan? Yes. He glanced at his watch. It'll be lunchtime in half an hour. At the end of the meal, I propose to make an announcement. Just state the fact that the pearls have been stolen, and that I must request everyone to stay in the dining saloon while a search is conducted. Poirot nodded approvingly. Tis well imagined. Whoever took the pearls still has them. By giving the warning beforehand, there will be no chance of their being thrown overboard in a panic. Grace drew some sheets of paper toward him. He murmured apologetically. 
I like to make a brief presence of the facts as I go along. It keeps one mind free of confusion. You'll do what? Method and order there everything, replied Poirot. Race wrote for some minutes in his small, neat script. Finally, he pushed the result of his labors toward Poirot. Anything you don't agree with there? Poirot took up the sheets. Murder of Mrs. Lynette Doyle. Mrs. Doyle was last seen alive by her maid, Louise Bourget. Time, 11.30 approximately. From 11.30 to 12.20, following of alibis, Cornelia Robson, James Fanthorpe, Simon Doyle, Jacqueline de Belfort, nobody else. But crime almost certainly committed after that time, since it is practically certain that pistol used was Jacqueline de Belfort's, which was then in her handbag. That her pistol was used is not absolutely certain until after post-mortem and expert evidence re-bullet, but it may be taken as overwhelmingly probable. Probable course of events. X, the murderer, was witness of scene between Jacqueline and Simon Doyle in observation saloon, and noted where pistol went under settee. After the saloon was vacant, X procured pistol, his or her idea being that Jacqueline de Belfort would be thought guilty of crime. On this theory, certain people are automatically cleared of suspicion. Cornelia Robson, since she had no opportunity to take pistol before James Fanthorpe returned to search for it. Miss Bowers, same. Dr. Besner, same. And B. Fanthorpe is not definitely excluded from suspicion, since he could actually have pocketed pistol while declaring himself unable to find it. Any other person could have taken the pistol during that ten minutes interval. Possible motives for the murder. Andrew Pennington. This is on the assumption that he has been guilty of fraudulent practices. There is a certain amount of evidence in favor of that assumption, but not enough to justify making it a case against him. If it was he who rolled down the boulder, he is a man who can seize a chance when it presents itself. The crime clearly was not premeditated except in a general way. Last night's shooting scene was an ideal opportunity. Objections to the theory of Pennington's guilt. Why did he throw the pistol overboard since it constituted a valuable clue against J.B.? Fleetwood, motive of revenge. Fleetwood considered himself injured by Lynette Doyle. Might have overheard scene and no deposition of pistol. He may have taken pistol because it was a handy weapon rather than with the idea of throwing guilt on Jacqueline. This would fit in with throwing it overboard, but if that were the case, why did he write J in Blood on the Wall? N.B. cheap handkerchief found with pistol, more likely to have belonged to a man like Fleetwood than to one of the well-to-do passengers. Rosalie Otterborn Or to accept Miss Van Schuyler's evidence or Rosalie's denial, something was thrown overboard at that time, and that something was presumably the pistol wrapped up in the velvet stole. Points to be noted. Had Rosalie any motive? She may have disliked Lynette Doyle, and even been envious of her, but as a motive for murder, that seems grossly inadequate. The evidence against her can only be convincing if it discovered an inadequate motive. As far as we know, there is no previous knowledge or link between Rosalie Otterborn and Lynette Doyle. Miss Van Schuyler. The velvet stolen pistol was wrapped belongs to Miss Van Schuyler. According to her own statement, she last saw it in the observation saloon. She drew attention to its loss during the evening, and a search was made for it without success. How did the stole come into the possession of X? Did X purloin it some time early in the evening? But if so, why? Nobody could tell in advance that there was going to be a scene between Jacqueline and Simon. Did X find the stole in the saloon when he went to get the pistol from under the settee? But if so, why was it not found when the search for it was made? Did it ever leave Miss Van Schuyler's possession? That is to say, did Miss Van Schuyler murder Lynette Doyle? Is her accusation of Rosalie Arborn a deliberate lie? If she did murder her, what was her motive? Other possibilities. Robbery as a motive. Possible, since the pearls had disappeared and Lynette Doyle was certainly wearing them last night. Someone with a grudge against the Ridgeway family. Possible. Again, no evidence. We know that there is a dangerous man on board, a killer. Here we have a killer and a death. May not the two be connected, but we should have to show that Lynette Doyle possessed dangerous knowledge concerning this man. Conclusions. We can group the persons on board into two classes. 
those who had a possible motive or against whom there is no definite evidence, and those who, as far as we know, are free of suspicion. Group 1. Andrew Pennington, Fleetwood, Rosalie Otterborn, Miss Van Schuyler, Louise Bourget, Robbery, Ferguson, Political. Group 2. Mrs. Allerton, Tim Allerton, Cordelia Robson, Miss Bowers, Dr. Besner, Signora Chetty, Mrs. Otterborn, James Fanthorpe. Poirot pushed the paper back. It is very just, very exact, what you have written there. You agree with it? Yes. And now, what is your contribution? Poirot drew himself up in an important manner. Me? I posed to myself one question. Why was the pistol thrown overboard? That's all? At the moment, yes. Until I can arrive at a satisfactory answer to that question, there is no sense anywhere. That is, that must be the starting point. You will notice, my friend, that in your summary of where we stand, you have not attempted to answer that point. Ray shrugged his shoulders. Panic. Poro shook his head perplexedly. He picked up the sodden velvet wrap from the table and smoothed it out, wet and limp on the table. His finger traced the scorch marks and the burnt holes. Tell me, my friend, he said suddenly, you are more conversant with firearms than am I. Would such a thing as this, wrapped around the pistol, make much difference in muffling the sound? No, it wouldn't. Not like a silencer, for instance. Poirot nodded. He went on. A man, certainly a man who had had much handling of firearms, would know that. But a woman, a woman would not know. Race looked at him curiously. Mm, probably not. No, she would have read detective stories, for they are not always very exact as to details. Race flicked the little pearl-handled pistol with his finger. This little fellow wouldn't make much noise anyway, he said. Just a pop, that's all. With any other noise around, ten to one you wouldn't notice it. Yes, I have reflected as to that. He picked up the handkerchief and examined it. A man's handkerchief, but not a gentleman's. Say, Cher Woolworth, I imagine. Three pence at most. The sort of handkerchief a man like Fleetwood would own. Yes, Andrew Pennington, I know this, carries a very fine silk handkerchief. Ferguson, suggested Race. Possibly, as a gesture, but then it ought to be a bandana. Used it instead of a glove, I suppose, to hold the pistol and obviate fingerprints. Race added with slight facetiousness, the clue of the blushing handkerchief. Ah, yes, by the Jeanville Collard, is it not? He laid it down and returned to the stole, once more examining the powder marks. All the same, he murmured. It is odd. What's that? Poirot said gently. Cette pauvre Madame Doyle, lying there so peacefully, with a little hole in her head. You remember how she looked? Grace looked at him curiously. You know, he said, I've got an idea you're trying to tell me something. But I haven't the faintest idea what it is. Chapter 18 There was a tap on the door. Come in, Grace called. A steward entered. Excuse me, sir, he said to Poirot, but Mr. Doyle is asking for you. I will come. Poirot rose. He went out of the room and up the companionway to the promenade deck and along it to Dr. Besner's cabin. Simon, his face flushed and feverish, was propped up with pillows. He looked embarrassed. Awfully good of you to come along, Mojoburo. Look here, there's something I want to ask you. Yes? Simon got still redder in the face. It's... it's about Jackie. I want to see her. 
Do you think... Would you mind? Would she mind, do you think? If you asked her to come along here? You know, I've been lying here thinking, that wretched kid. She is only a kid, after all, and I treated her damn badly. He stammered to silence. Poirot looked at him with interest. You desire to see Mademoiselle Jacqueline? I will fetch her. Thanks. Awfully good of you. Poirot went on his quest. He found Jacqueline de Belfort sitting huddled up in a corner of the observation saloon. There was an open book on her lap, but she was not reading. Poirot said gently, Will you come with me, mademoiselle? Mojo Doyle wants to see you. She started up. Her face flushed, then paled. She looked bewildered. Simon? Wants to see me? To see me? He found her incredulity moving. Will you come, mademoiselle? I... Yes, of course I will. She went with him in a docile fashion, like a child, but like a puzzled child. Poirot passed into the cabin. Here is mademoiselle. She stepped in after him, wavered, stood still, standing there mute and dumb, her eyes fixed on Simon's face. Hello, Jaggy. He too was embarrassed. He went on. Awfully good of you to come. Wanted to say, I mean, what I mean is. She interrupted him then. Her words came out in a rush, breathless, desperate. Simon, I didn't kill Annette. You know I didn't do that. I, I was mad last night. Oh, can you ever forgive me? Words came more easily to him now. Of course, that's all right. Absolutely all right. That's what I wanted to say. But you might be worrying a bit, you know. Worrying a bit? Oh, Simon. That's what I wanted to see you about. It's quite all right. See, old girl. You just got a bit rattled last night. A shade tight. Oh, perfectly natural. Oh, Simon, I might have killed you. Not you. Not with a rotten little pea shooter like that. And your leg. Perhaps you'll never walk again. Now look here, Jackie. Don't be maudlin. As soon as we get to Aswan, they're going to put the x-rays to work and dig out that tin pot bullet. And everything will be bright as rain. Jacqueline gulped twice. Then she rushed forward and knelt down by Simon's bed, burying her face and sobbing. Simon patted her awkwardly on the head. His eyes met Poirot's, and with a reluctant sigh, the latter left the cabin. He heard broken murmurs as he went. How could I be such a devil? Oh, Simon, I'm so dreadfully sorry. Outside, Cornelia Robson was leaning over the rail. She turned her head. Oh, it's you, Mojo Poirot. It seems so awful somehow that it should be such a lovely day. Poirot looked up at the sky. When the sun shines, you cannot see the moon, he said. But when the sun is gone, oh, when the sun is gone, Cornelia's mouth fell open. I beg your pardon. I was saying, mademoiselle, that when the sun has gone down, we shall see the moon. That is so, is it not? Why, well, yes, certainly. She looked at him doubtfully. Poirot laughed gently. I utter the imbecilities, he said. Take no notice. He strolled gently towards the stern of the boat. As he passed the next cabin, he paused for a minute. He caught fragments of speech from within. Utterly ungrateful after all I've done for you. No consideration for your wretched mother. No idea of what I suffer. Poirot's lips stiffened as he pressed them together. He raised a hand and knocked. There was a startled silence, and Mrs. Otterborn's voice called out, Who's that? Is Mademoiselle Rosalie here? Rosalie appeared in the doorway. Poirot was shocked at her appearance, 
There were dark circles under her eyes and drawn lines around her mouth. What's the matter? She said ungraciously. What do you want? The pleasure of a few minutes' conversation with you, mademoiselle. Will you come? Her mouth went sulky at once. She saw him a suspicious look. Why should I? I entreat you, mademoiselle. Oh, I suppose. She stepped out on the deck, closing the door behind her. Well? Poro took her gently by the arm and drew her along the deck, still in the direction of the stern. They passed the bathrooms and round the corner. They had the stern part of the deck to themselves. The Nile flowed away behind them. Poro rested his elbows on the rail. Rosalie stood up straight and stiff. Well, she said again, and her voice held the same ungracious tone. Poirot spoke slowly, choosing his words. I could ask you certain questions, mademoiselle, but I do not think for one moment that you would consent to answer them. Seems rather a waste to bring me along here, then. Poirot drew her finger slowly along the wooden rail. You are accustomed, mademoiselle, to carrying your own burdens, but you can do that too long. The strain becomes too great. For you, mademoiselle, the strain is becoming too great. I don't know what you're talking about, said Rosalie. I'm talking about facts, mademoiselle, plain, ugly facts. Let us call the spade the spade, and say it in one little short sentence. Your mother drinks, mademoiselle. Rosalie did not answer. Her mouth opened, then she closed it again. For once, she seemed at a loss. There is no need for you to talk, mademoiselle. I will do all the talking. I was interested it as one in the relations existing between you. I saw at once that, in spite of your carefully studied unfilial remarks, you were in reality passionately protecting her from something. I very soon knew what that something was. I knew it long before I encountered your mother one morning in an unmistakable state of intoxication. Moreover, her case, I could see, was one of secret bouts of drinking, by far the most difficult kind of case with which to deal. You were coping with it manfully. Nevertheless, she had all the secret drunkard's cunning. She managed to get hold of a secret supply of spirits and to keep it successfully hidden from you. I should not be surprised if you discovered its hiding place only yesterday. Accordingly, last night, as soon as your mother was really soundly asleep, you stole out with the contents of the cash, went round the other side of the boat, since your own side was up against the bank, and cast it overboard into the Nile. He paused. I am right, am I not? Yes, you're quite right, Rosalie spoke with sudden passion. I was a fool not to say, I suppose, but I didn't want everyone to know. It would go all over the boat. It seemed so, so silly. I mean, that I... Poirot finished the sentence for her. So silly that you should be suspected of committing a murder? Rosalie nodded. Then she burst out again. I've tried so hard to keep everyone from knowing. It isn't really her fault. She got discouraged. Her books didn't sell anymore. People are tired of all that cheap sex stuff. It hurt her. It hurt her dreadfully. And so she began to, to drink. For a long time I didn't know why she was so queer. And when I found out I tried to to stop it. She'd be all right for a bit, and then suddenly she'd start, and there'd be dreadful quarrels and rows with people. It was awful. She shuddered. I had always to be on the watch to get her away. And then she began to dislike me for it. She, She's turned right against me. I think she almost hates me sometimes. Oh, putty said Poirot. She turned on him vehemently. Don't be sorry for me. Don't be kind. 
It's easier if you're not. She sighed, a long, heart-rending sigh. I'm so tired. I'm so deadly, deadly tired. I know, said Poro. People think I'm awful. Stuck up and cross and bad-tempered. I can't help it. I've forgotten how to be. To be nice. That is what I said to you. You have carried your burden by yourself too long. Rosalie said slowly. It is a relief to talk about it. You, you've always been kind to me, Morubo. I'm afraid I've been rude to you often. La Polite. It is not necessary between friends. The suspicion came back to her face suddenly. Are you... Are you going to tell everyone? I suppose you must, because those damn bottles I threw overboard. No, no, it is not necessary. Just tell me what I want to know. At what time was this? Ten minutes past one? About that, I should think. Don't remember exactly. Yeah, tell me, mademoiselle. Miss Van Scala saw you. Did you see her? Rosalie shook her head. No, I didn't. She says that she looked out of the door of her cabin. I don't think I should have seen her. I just looked along the deck and then out to the river. Poro nodded. And did you see anyone at all when you looked down the deck? There was a pause. Quite a long pause. Rosalie was frowning. She seemed to be thinking earnestly. At last, she shook her head quite decisively. No, she said. I saw nobody. Hercule Poro slowly nodded his head, but his eyes were grave. Chapter 19 People crept into the dining salon by ones and twos in a very subdued manner. There seemed to be a general feeling that to sit down eagerly to food displayed an unfortunate heartlessness. It was with an almost apologetic air that one passenger after another came and sat down at their table. Tim Allerton arrived some few minutes after his mother had taken her seat. He was looking in a thoroughly bad temper. I wish we'd never come on this blasted trip, he growled. Mrs. Allerton shook her head sadly. Oh, my dear, so do I. That beautiful girl, it all seems such a waste to think that anyone could have shot her in cold blood. It seems awful to me that anyone could do such a thing, and that other poor child. Jacqueline? Yes, my heart aches for her. She looks so dreadfully unhappy. Teach her not to go around loose enough to leave our arms, said Tim unfeelingly as he helped himself to butter. I expect she was badly brought up. Oh, for God's sake, Mother, don't go all maternal about it. You're in a shocking bad temper, Tim. Yes, I am. Who wouldn't be? I don't see what there is to be cross about. It's just frightfully sad. Tim said crossly. You're taking the romantic point of view. But you don't seem to realize that it's no joke being mixed up in a murder case. Mrs. Allerton looked a bit startled. But surely. That's just it. There's no but surely about it. Everyone on this damn boat is under suspicion. You and I as well as the rest. Mrs. Allerton demurred. Technically we are, I suppose. But actually it's ridiculous. There's nothing ridiculous where murder is concerned. You may sit there, darling, just exuding virtue and conscious rectitude, but a lot of unpleasant policemen at Shalal or Aswan won't take you at your face value. Perhaps the truth will be known before then. Why should it be? Mucho Poro may find out. That old Montebank, he won't find out anything. He's all talk and mustaches. Well, Tim, said Mrs. Arton, I dare say everything you say is true, but even if it is, we've got to go through with it. 
So we might as well make up our minds to do it. Go through with it as cheerfully as we can. But her son showed no abatement of gloom. And there's this blasted business of the pearls being missing, too. Lynette's pearls? Yes, it seems somebody must have pinched them. I suppose that was the motive for the crime, said Mrs. Arton. Why should it be? You're mixing up two perfectly different things. Who told you that they were missing? Ferguson. He got it from his tough friend in the engine room. Got it from the maid. They were lovely pearls, said Mrs. Allerton. Poro sat down at the table, bowing to Mrs. Allerton. I am a little late, he said. I expect you've been busy. Yes, I have been much occupied. He ordered a fresh bottle of wine from the waiter. We are very Catholic in our tastes, said Mrs. Allerton. You drink wine always. Tim drinks whiskey and soda, and I try all the different blends of mineral water in turn. Tiens, said Poirot. He stared at her for a moment. He murmured to himself, It is an idea, that. Then, with an impatient shrug of his shoulders, he dismissed the sudden preoccupation that had distracted him, and began to chat lightly of other matters. Is Mr. Doyle badly hurt? asked Mrs. Allerton. Yes, it is a very serious injury. Dr. Besson is anxious to reach Aswan, so that his leg can be x-rayed and the bullet removed, but he hopes that there will be no permanent lameness. Poor Simon, said Mrs. Allerton. Only yesterday he looked such a happy boy with everything in the world he wanted. And now his beautiful wife killed, and he himself laid up and helpless. I do hope so. What do you hope, madame? asked Poro as Mrs. Arden paused. I hope he's not too angry with that poor child. With Mademoiselle Jacqueline? Quite the contrary. He was full on anxiety on her behalf. He turned to Tim. You know, it is a pretty little problem of psychology, that. All the time that Mademoiselle Jacqueline was following them from place to place, he was absolutely furious. But now, when she has actually shot him, and wounded him dangerously, perhaps made him lame for life, all his anger seems to have evaporated. Can you understand that? Yes, said Tim thoughtfully. I think I can. The first thing made him feel a fool. Poro nodded. You're right. It offended his male dignity. But now, if you look at it a certain way, it's she who's made a fool of herself. Everyone's down on her, and so... He can be generously forgiving, finished Mrs. Allerton. What children men are. A profoundly untrue statement that women always make, murmured Tim. Poro smiled, then he said to Tim, Tell me, Madame Doyle's cousin, Miss Joanna Southwood, did she resemble Madame Doyle? You've got it a little wrong, Mojo Poro. She was our cousin and Lynette's friend. Ah, pardon. I was confused. She is a young lady much in the news, that. I have been interested in her for some time. Why? asked Tim sharply. Poro half rose to bow to Jacqueline de Belfort, who had just come in, and passed their table on the way to her own. Her cheeks were flushed, and her eyes bright, and her breath came a little unevenly. As he resumed his seat, Poro seemed to have forgotten Tim's question. He murmured vaguely, I wonder if all the young ladies with valuable jewels are as careless as Madame Doyle was. It is true, then. They were stolen, asked Mrs. Allerton. Who told you so, Madame? Ferguson said so, said Tim. Poro nodded gravely. It is quite true. I suppose, said Mrs. Allerton nervously, that this will mean a lot of unpleasantness for all of us. Tim says it will. Her son scowled. 
But Poirot had turned to him. Ah, you have had the previous experience, perhaps? You have been in the house where there was a robbery? Never, said Tim. Oh, yes, darling. You were at the Port Arlington's that time, when that awful woman's diamonds were stolen. You always get things hopelessly wrong, Mother. I was there when it was discovered that the diamonds she was wearing around her fat neck were only based. The actual substitution was probably done months earlier. As a matter of fact, a lot of people said she'd done it done herself. Joanna said so, I expect. Joanna wasn't there. But she knew them quite well, and it's very like her to make that kind of suggestion. You're always down on Joanna, Mother. Poirot hastily changed the subject. He had it in mind to make a really big purchase at one of the Aswan shops. Some very attractive purple and gold material at one of the Indian merchants. There would, of course, be the duty to pay, but... They tell me that they can... How do you say? Expedite it for me. And that the charges will not be too high. How think you? Will it arrive all right? Mrs. Allerton said that many people, so she had heard, had had things sent straight to England from the shops in question, and that everything had arrived safely. Bien, then I will do that. But the trouble one has, when one is abroad, if a parcel comes out from England, have you had experience of that? Have you had any parcels arrive since you have been on your travels? I don't think we have, have we, Tim? You get books sometimes, but of course there's never any trouble about them. Ah, no. Books are different. Dessert had been served. Now, without any previous warning, Colonel Ray stood up and made his speech. He touched on the circumstances of the crime and announced the theft of the pearls. A search of the boat was about to be instituted and he would be obliged if all the passengers would remain in the saloon until this was completed. Then, after all of the passengers agreed, as he was sure they would, they themselves would be kind enough to submit to a search. Poirot slipped nimbly along to his side. There was a little buzz and hum all round them, voices doubtful, indignant, excited. Poirot reached Race's side and murmured something in his ear just as the latter was about to leave the dining saloon. Race listened, nodded assent, and beckoned a steward. He said a, a few brief words to him. Then, together with Poirot, he passed out onto the deck, closing the door behind him. They stood for a minute or two by the rail. Race lit a cigarette. Not a bad idea of yours, he said. We'll soon see if there's anything in it. I'll give them three minutes. The door of the dining room opened, and the same steward to whom they had spoken came out. He saluted Race and said, Quite right, sir. There's a lady who says it's urgent she should speak to you at once without any delay. Ah, Race's face showed his satisfaction. Who is it? Miss Bowers, sir, the hospital nurse lady. A slight shade of surprise showed on Race's face, he said. Bring her to the smoking room. Don't let anyone else leave. No, sir. The other steward will attend to that. He went back into the dining room. Poirot and Race went to the smoking room. Bowers, eh? murmured Race. They had hardly got inside the smoking room before the steward reappeared with Miss Bowers. He ushered her in and left, shutting the door behind him. Well, Miss Bowers, Colonel Race looked at her inquiringly, what's all this? Miss Bowers looked her usual composed, unhurried self. She displayed no particular emotion. You'll excuse me, Colonel Race, but under the circumstances I thought the best thing to do would be to speak to you at once. She opened her neat black handbag, and to return you these. She took out a string of pearls, and laid them on the table. Chapter 20 if Miss Bowers had been the kind of woman who enjoyed creating a sensation, she would have been richly repaid by the result of her action. A look of utter astonishment passed over Colonel Race's face as he picked up the pearls from the table. This is most extraordinary, he said. Will you kindly explain, Miss Bowers? Of course, 
That's what I've come to do. Miss Bower settled herself comfortably in a chair. Naturally, it was a little difficult for me to decide what is the best for me to do. The family would naturally be averse to scandal of any kind, and they trust my discretion. But the circumstances are so very unusual that it really leaves me no choice. Of course, when you didn't find anything in the cabin, your next move would be a search of the passengers, and if the pearls were then found in my possession, it would be a rather an awkward situation, and the truth would come out just the same. And just what is the truth? Did you take these pearls from Mrs. Doyle's cabin? Oh, no, Colonel Race. Of course not. Miss Van Schuyler did. Miss Van Schuyler? Yeah, she can't help it, you know, but she does, sir, take things, especially jewelry. That's really why I'm always with her. It's not her health at all. It's this little idiosyncrasy. I keep on the alert, and fortunately there's never been any trouble since I've been with her. It just means being watchful, you know. And she always hides the things she takes to the same place, rolled up in a pair of stockings, so that makes it very simple. I look each morning. Of course, I'm a light sleeper, and I always sleep next door to her, and with the communicating door open, if it's in a hotel, so that I usually hear. Then I go after her and persuade her to go back to bed. Of course, it's been rather more difficult on a boat, but she doesn't usually do it at night. It's more just picking up things that she sees left about. Of course, pearls have a great attraction for her always. Mrs. Bowers ceased speaking. Ray said, How did you discover they had been taken? They were in her stockings this morning. I knew whose they were, of course. I've often noticed them. I went along to put them back, hoping that Mrs. Doyle wasn't up yet and hadn't discovered her loss. But there was a steward standing there, and he told me about the murder, and that no one could go in. So then, you see, I was in a regular quandary. But I still hope to slip them back in the cabin later before their absence had been noticed. I can assure you I passed a very unpleasant morning, wondering what was the best thing to do. You see, the Van Schuyler family is so very particular and exclusive. It would never do if this got into the newspapers, but that won't be necessary, will it? Miss Bowers really looked worried. It depends on circumstances, said Colonel Race cautiously. But we shall do our best for you, of course. What does Miss Van Schuyler say to this? Oh, she'll deny it, of course. She always does. Says some wicked person has put it there. She never admits taking anything. That's why if you catch her in time, she goes back to bed like a lamb. Says she just went out to look at the moon. Something like that. Does Miss Robson know about this, sir? Failing. No, she doesn't. Her mother knows, but she's a very simple kind of girl, and her mother thought it best she should know nothing about it. I was quite equal to dealing with Miss Van Schuyler, added the competent Miss Bowers. We have to thank you, Mademoiselle, for coming to us so promptly, said Poirot. Miss Bowers stood up. I'm sure I've acted for the best. Be assured that you have. You see, what with there being a murder as well... Colonel Race interrupted her. His voice was grave. Miss Bowers, I'm going to ask you a question, and I want to impress upon you that it has got to be answered truthfully. Miss Van Schuyler is unhinged mentally to the extent of being a kleptomaniac. Has she also a tendency to homicidal mania? Miss Bowers answered him immediately. Oh, dear me, no. Nothing of the kind. You can take my word for it absolutely. The old lady wouldn't hurt a fly. The reply came with such positive assurance that there seemed nothing more to be said. Nevertheless, Poirot did interpolate one mild inquiry. Does Miss Van Schuyler suffer at all time from deafness? As a matter of fact, she does, Monsieur Poirot. Not so that you'd notice it anyway. Not if you were speaking to her, I mean. But quite often she doesn't hear you come into a room. Things like that. Do you think you... Do you think she would have heard anyone moving about in Mrs. Doyle's cabin, which is next door to her own? Oh, I shouldn't think so, not for a minute. You see, the bunk is in the other side of the cabin, not even against the partition wall. 
No, I don't think she would have heard anything. Thank you, Miss Bowers. Perhaps you'll now go back to the dining saloon and wait with the others. He opened the door for her and watched her go down the staircase and enter the saloon. Then he shut the door and came back to the table. Poirot had picked up the pearls. Well, said Ray's grimly, that reaction came pretty quickly. That's a very cool-headed and astute young woman, perfectly capable of holding out on us still further if she thinks it suits her book. What about Miss Van Schuyler now? I don't think we can eliminate her from the possible suspects. You know, she might have committed murder to get hold of those jewels. We can't take the nurse's word for it. She's all out to do the best for the family. Poirot nodded in agreement. He was very busy with the pearls, running them through his fingers, holding them up to his eyes. He said, We may take it, I think, that part of the old lady's story to us was true. She did look out of her cabin, and she did see Rosalie Otterborn, but I don't think she heard anything or anyone in Lynette Doyle's cabin. I think she was just peering out from her cabin, preparatory to slipping along and purloining the pearls. The Otterborn girl was there then, yes, throwing her mother's secret cache of drink overboard. Colonel Race shook his head sympathetically. So that's it. Tough on a young'un. Yes, her life has not been very gay. C'est pauvre petit Rosalie. Well, I'm glad that that's been cleared up. She didn't see or hear anything. I asked her that. She responded, after a lapse of quite twenty seconds, that she saw nobody. Oh, Grace looked alert. Yes, it is suggestive that, Ray said slowly, if Lynette Doyle was shot round about ten minutes past one, or indeed any time after the boat had quieted down, it has seemed amazing to me that no one heard the shot. I grant you the little pistol like that wouldn't make much noise, but all the same, the boat would be deadly quiet, and any noise, even a gentle pop, should have been heard. But I begin to understand better now. The cabin on the forward side of hers was unoccupied since her husband was in Dr. Besner's cabin. The one aft was occupied by the Van Schuyler woman, who was deaf. That leaves only... He paused and looked expectantly at Poirot, who nodded. The cabin next to hers on the other side of the boat. In other words, Pennington. We always seem to come back to Pennington. We will come back to him presently with kid gloves removed. Ah, yes, I'm promising myself that pleasure. In the meantime, we'd better get on with our search of the boat. The pearls still make a convenient excuse, even though they have been returned. But Miss Bowers is not likely to advertise that fact. Ah, these pearls. Poro held them up against the light once more. He stuck out his tongue and licked them. He even gingerly tried one of them between his teeth. Then, with a sigh, he threw them down on the table. Here are more complications, my friend, he said. I am not an expert on precious stones, but I have had a good deal to do with them in my time, and I am fairly certain of what I say. These pearls are only a clever imitation. Chapter 21 Colonel Race swore lustily. This damn case gets more and more involved. He picked up the pearls. I suppose you've not made a mistake. They look all right to me. They are a very good imitation, yes. Now where does that lead us? I suppose Lynette Doyle didn't deliberately have an imitation made and bring it aboard with her for safety. Many women do. I think, if that were so, her husband would know about it. She may not have told him. Poro shook his head in a dissatisfied manner. No, I do not think that is so. I was admiring Mrs. Doyle's pearls the first evening on the boat. Their wonderful sheen and luster. I am sure that she was wearing the genuine ones then. 
What brings up us, us up against two possibilities? First, that Miss Van Schuyler only stole the imitation string after the real ones have been stolen by someone else. Second, that the whole kleptomaniac story is a fabrication, and that Miss Bowers is a thief and quickly invented the story and allayed suspicion by handing over the false pearls, or else the whole party is in it together. That is to say, they're a gang of clever jewel thieves masquerading as an exclusive American family. Yes, Poro murmured. It is difficult to say. But I will point out to you one thing. To make a perfect and exact copy of the pearls clasp and doll, good enough to stand the chance of deceiving Mrs. Doyle, is a highly skilled technical performance. It could not be done in a hurry. Whoever copied those pearls must have had good opportunity of studying the original. Race rose to his feet. Useless to speculate about it any further now. Let's get on with the job. We've got to find the real pearls, and at the same time, we'll keep our eyes open. They disposed first to the cabins occupied on the lower deck. That of Signor Ricetti contained various archaeological works in different languages, a varied assortment of clothing, hair lotions of a highly scented kind, and two personal letters. One from an archaeological expedition in Syria, and one from, apparently, a sister in Rome. His handkerchiefs were all of colored silk. They passed on to Ferguson's cabin. There was a sprinkling of communistic literature, a good many snapshots, Samuel Butler's Erewhon, and a cheap edition of Pepe's Diary. His personal possessions were not many. Most of that, outer clothing, torn, and dirty. Underclothing, on the other hand, was of really good quality. The handkerchiefs were expensive linen ones. Some interesting discrepancies, murmured Poirot. Race nodded. Rather odd that there are absolutely no personal papers, letters, etc. Yes, that gives one to think. An odd young man, Monsieur Ferguson. He looked thoughtfully at a signet ring he held in his hand before replacing it at the drawer where he'd found it. They went along to the cabin occupied by Louise Bourget. The maid had her meals after the other passengers, but Race had sent word that she was to be taken to join the others. A cabin steward met them. I'm sorry, sir, he apologized. I have not been able to find the young woman anywhere, and I can't think where she can have got to. Race glanced inside the cabin. It was empty. They went up to the promenade deck and started on the starboard side. The first cabin was that occupied by James Fanthorpe. Here all was in meticulous order. Mr. Fanthorpe traveled light, but all that he had was of good quality. No letters, said Poro thoughtfully. He is careful, or Mr. Fanthorpe, to destroy his correspondence. And they passed on to Tim Allerton's cabin next door. There were evidences here of an Anglo-Catholic turn of mind, an exquisite little triptych and a big rosary of intricately carved wood. Besides personal clothing, there was a half-completed manuscript, a good deal annotated and scribbled over, and a good collection of books, most of them recently published. There were also a quantity of letters thrown carelessly into a drawer. Poirot, never in the least scrupulous about reading other people's correspondence, glanced through them. He noted that amongst them there were no letters from Joanna Southwood. He picked up a tube of secotine, fingered it absently for a minute or two, and said, Let us pass on. No World War worth handkerchiefs, said Race, rapidly replacing the contents of a drawer. Mrs. Allerton's cabin was annexed. It was exquisitely neat, and a faint old-fashioned smell of lavender hung about it. The two men's search was soon over. Race remarked as they left it. Nice woman, that. The next cabin was that which had been used as a dressing room by Simon Doyle. His immediate necessities, pajamas, toilet things, etc., had been moved to Besner's cabin, but the remainder of his possessions were still there. Two good-sized leather suitcases and a kit bag. There were also some clothes in the wardrobe. 
We will look carefully here, my friend, said Poro, for it is very possible that the thief hid the pearls here. You think it's likely? Um, but yes, indeed consider. The thief, whoever he or she may be, must know that sooner or later a search will be made, and therefore a hiding place in his or her own cabin would be injudicious in the extreme. The public rooms present other difficulties, but here is a cabin belonging to a man who cannot possibly visit it himself, so that if the pearls are found here, it tells us nothing at all. But the most meticulous search failed to reveal any trace of the missing necklace. Poro murmured, Zut! to himself, and they emerged once more on the deck. That Doyle's cabin had been locked after the body was removed, but Race had the key with him. He unlocked the door, and the two men stepped inside. Except for the removal of the girl's body, the cabin was exactly as it had been that morning. Poirot, if there's anything to be found here, for God's sake, go ahead and find it. You can if anyone can, I know that. This time you do not mean the pearls, mon ami? No, the murder is the main thing. There may be something overlooked this morning. Quietly, deftly, Poro went about his search. He went down on his knees and scrutinized the floor inch by inch. He examined the bed. He went rapidly through the wardrobe and chest of drawers. He went through the wardrobe trunk and the two costly suitcases. He looked through the expensive gold-fitting dressing case. Finally, he turned his attention to the washstand. There were various creams, powders, face lotions. But the only thing that seemed to interest Poirot were two little bottles labeled nail -X. He picked them up at last and brought them to the dressing table. One, which bore the inscription nail -X Rose, was empty but for a drop or two of dark red fluid at the bottom. The other, the same size, was labeled Nalex Cardinal, was nearly full. Poro uncorked first the empty, then the full one, and sniffed them both delicately. An odor of pear drops billowed into the broom. With a slight grimace, he recorked them. Get anything? asked Reyes. Poro replied by a French proverb. On ne prend pas les bons avec le vinaigre. Then he said with a sigh, My friend, we have not been fortunate. The murderer has not been obliging. He has not dropped for us the cufflink, the cigarette end, the cigar ash, or in the case of woman, the handkerchief, the lipstick, or the hair slide. Only the bottle of nail polish. Poro shrugged his shoulders. I must ask the maid. There is something, yes, a little curious there. I wonder where the devil the girls got to, said Reyes. They left the cabin, locking the door behind them, and passed on to that of Miss Van Schuyler. Here again were all the appurtenances of wealth, expensive toilet fittings, good luggage, a certain number of private letters and papers, all perfectly in order. The next cabin was the double one occupied by Poirot and beyond it that of Ray's. Hardly likely to hide him in either of these, said the colonel. Poirot demurred. It might be. Once on the Orient Express I investigated a murder. There was a little matter of a scarlet kimono. It had disappeared, and yet it must be on the train. I found it, where do you think, in my own locked suitcase. It was an impertinence that well, let's see if anybody has been impertinent with you or me this time. But the Thief of the Pearls had not been impertinent with Hercule Poirot or with Colonel Race. Browning the stern, they made a very careful search of Miss Bower's cabin, but could find nothing of a suspicious nature. Her handkerchiefs were of plain linen with an initial. The Otterborn's cabin came next. Here again, Poirot made a very meticulous search, but with no result. The next cabin was Besner's. Simon Doyle lay with an untasted tray of food beside him. Huff, my feed, he said apologetically. 
He was looking feverish and very much worse than earlier in the day. Poirot appreciated Besner's anxiety to get him as swiftly as possible to hospital and skilled appliances. The little Belgian explained what the two of them were doing, and Simon nodded approval on learning that the pearls had been restored by Miss Bowers, but proved to be merely imitation. He expressed the most complete astonishment. You are quite sure of Mr. Doyle? That your wife did not have an imitation string which she brought aboard with her instead of the real ones? Simon shook his head decisively. Oh no, I'm quite sure of that. Lynette loved those pearls, and she wore them everywhere. They were insured against every possible risk, so I think that made her a bit careless. Then we must continue our search. He started opening drawers. Race attacked a suitcase. Simon stared. Look here, you surely don't suspect old Besner pinched them. Otto shrugged his shoulders. It might be so. After all, what do we know of Dr. Besner? Only what he himself gives out. But he couldn't have hidden them in here without my seeing him. He could not have hidden anything today without your having seen him. But we do not know when the substitution took place. He may have effected the exchange some days ago. I never thought of that. But the search was unavailing. The next cabin was Pennington's. The two men spent some time in their search. In particular, Poirot and Race examined carefully a case full of legal and business documents, most of them requiring Lynette's signature. He shook his head gloomily. These seem all square and above board. You agree? Absolutely. Still, the man isn't a born fool. If there had been a compromising document there, power of attorney or something of that kind, he'd be pretty sure to have destroyed it first thing. That is so, yes. Poirot lifted a heavy Colt revolver out of the top drawer of the chest of drawers, looked at it, and put it back. So it seems there are still some people who travel with revolvers, he murmured. Yes, a little suggestive, perhaps. Still, Lynette Doyle wasn't shot with a thing that size. He paused and then said, You know, I've thought of a possible answer to your point about the pistol being thrown overboard. Supposing that the actual murderer did leave it in Lynette Doyle's cabin, and that someone else, some second person, took it away and threw it into the river. Yes, that is possible. I have thought of it. But it opens up a whole string of questions. Who was that second person? What interest had they in endeavoring to shield Jack and Bell for by taking away the pistol? What was that second person doing there? The only other person we know of who went into the cabin was Miss Van Schuyler. Was it conceivably Miss Van Schuyler who removed it? Why should she wish to shield Jacqueline Bell for? And yet, what other reason can there be for the removal of the pistol? Ray suggested. Mm, she may have recognized the stole as hers, got the wind up, and thrown the whole bag of tricks over on that account. The stole, perhaps. But would she have got rid of the pistol, too? Still, I agree that is a possible solution. But it is clumsy. Won't do, it is clumsy. And you still have not appreciated one point about the stall. As they emerged from Pennington's cabin, Poirot suggested that Race should search the remaining cabins, those occupied by Jacqueline, Cornelia, and two empty ones at the end, while he himself had a few words with Simon Doyle. Accordingly, he retraced his steps along the deck and re-entered Besner's cabin. Simon said, Look here, I've been thinking. I'm perfectly sure that these pearls were all right yesterday. Why is that, Mr. Doyle? Because Lynette, he winced as he uttered his wife's name, was passing them through her hands just before dinner and talking about them. She knew something about pearls. I feel certain she'd have known that they were a fake. They were a very good imitation, though. Tell me, was Mrs. Doyle in the habit of letting those pearls out of her hands? Did she ever lend them to a friend, for instance? Simon flushed with slight embarrassment. Uh, you see, Monsieur Poirot, it's difficult for me to say. I... Well, you see, I hadn't known Lynette very long. 
Ah, no, it was a quick romance, your. Simon went on. And so, really, I shouldn't know a thing like that, but Lynette was awfully generous with her things. I should think she might have done. She never, for instance, Otto's voice was very smooth, she never, for instance, lent them to Mademoiselle de Belfort? What do you mean? Simon flushed brick red, tried to sit up, and wincing, fell back. What are you getting at? That Jackie stole the pearls? She didn't. I'll swear she didn't. Jackie's as straight as a die. The mere idea of her being a thief is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Poirot looked at him with gently twinkling eyes. Oh, la la, he said unexpectedly. That suggestion of mine, it has indeed stood up the nest of hornets. Simon repeated doggedly, unmoved by Poirot's lighter note. Jackie's straight. Poirot remembered a girl's voice by the Nile and asked one, saying, I love Simon, and he loves me. He had wondered which of the three statements he had heard that night was the true one. It seemed to him that it had turned out to be Jacqueline who had come closest to the truth. The door opened and Race came in. Nothing, he said brusquely. But we didn't expect it. I see the stewards coming along with a report as to the searching of the passengers. A steward and stewardess appeared in the doorway. The former spoke first. Nothing, sir. Any of the gentlemen make any fuss? Only oh, the Italian gentleman, sir. He carried on a good deal. Said it was a dishonor, something of that kind. He'd got a gun on him, too. What kind of gun? How's the automatic 25, sir? Italians are pretty hot-tempered, said Simon. Ricchetti got in no end of a stew at Wadi Halifa just because of a mistake over a telegram. He was darn rude to Lynette over it. Grace turned to the stewardess. She was a big, handsome-looking woman. Nothing on any of the ladies, sir. They made a good deal of us, except for Mrs. Allerton, who was as nice as nice could be. Not a sign of the pearls. By the way, the young lady, Miss Rosalie Otterborn, had a little pistol in her handbag. What kind? It was a very small one, sir, with a pearl handle. A kind of toy. Ray stared. Devil take this case, he muttered. I thought we'd got her clear to suspicion, and now, does every girl on this blinking boat carry on pearl handled toy pistols? He shot a question at the stewardess. Did she show any feeling over your finding it? The woman shook her head. I don't think she noticed. I had my back turned whilst I was going through her handbags. Still, she must have known you'd come across it. Oh, well, it beats me. What about the maid? We looked all over the boat, sir. We can't find her anywhere. What's this? asked Simon. Mrs. Doyle's maid, Louise Bourget. She's disappeared. Disappeared? Ray said thoughtfully. She might have stolen the pearls. She is the one person with ample opportunity to get a replica made. And then, when she found a search was being instituted, she threw herself overboard, suggested Simon. Nonsense, said Ray irritably. A woman can't throw herself overboard in broad daylight from a boat like this without somebody realizing the fact she's bound to be somewhere on board. He addressed the stewardess once more. When was she last seen? About half an hour before the bell went up for lunch, sir. We'll have a look at her cabin anyway, said Race. That may tell us something. He led the way to the deck below. Poirot followed him, then locked the door of the cabin and passed inside. Louis Bourget, whose trade it was to keep other people's belongings in order, had taken a holiday where her own were concerned. Odds and ends littered the top of the chest of drawers, a suitcase gaped open with clothes hanging out of the side of it and preventing its shutting. Underclothing hung limply over the sides of the chairs. As Poirot, with swift, neat fingers, opened the drawers of the dressing chest, Race examined the suitcase. Louis's shoes were lined along by the bed. One of them, a black, patent, 
seemed to be resting at an extraordinary angle, almost unsupported. The appearance of it was so odd that it attracted Race's attention. He closed the suitcase and bent over the line of shoes. Then he uttered a sharp exclamation. Poirot whirled around. Qu'est-ce que qu'il y a? Ray said grimly. She hasn't disappeared. She's here. Under the bed. <laughs>